On this week in sales, we'll be looking at spaced learning, the Netflix of car sales, inclusive sales training, and much, much more. My name is Will Barron, founder of Salesman.org, and joining me, co-host of This Week in Sales, the coffee to my bean, the tea to my bag, the king of sales, Victor Antonio. The, How's it going, mate? By the way, do you, do you like rehearse those, come up with those, think about those in a show? Yes. Or what do I say? Oh, you got, oh, you got a list. He's got Three a list. seconds before we click record on Skype, <laughs> I write something down. And uh, today I was struggling, so it was literally just looking at my cup of green tea and coming up with it from there. Wonderful. Hey, by the way, how was your vacation, Will? It was uh, good. Give the, audience, give the audience a little insight, the who, what, when, where, why. Me, my partner, uh, my missus, and Walter, the golden retriever, went up to the Lake District, up to Derrick Walter, for, I think it was five nights, which we've not done in absolutely ages. Went up to the lodge site up there, which was literally on Derrick Water, uh, which is a, a famous lake up in the Lake District. We did some walking. We bought some new walking clothes. We had the dog get crap everywhere and just be constantly wet and damp. It rained every single day. I think we went there on Tuesday. I looked at the weather report on my iPhone and it was Wednesday, 100% chance of rain. Thursday, 100% chance of rain. Friday, 100% chance of rain. And it just, just pissed it down the whole week, which is fine for me. I quite like walking and, and plodding about in the rain and the Lake District is the perfect place to do it. And most importantly, Victor, we found a beer garden that there was just no one in. So me and Emily just sat in the beer garden in between shopping and walking the hills and uh, just had three or four pints each day with the dog. It was lovely. I love it. Hey, uh, post at least one picture of what it looks like there on the blog. I think it'd be great. So I will Go to thisweekinsales.com and check up. We'll, we'll post at least one picture. Right? I'm going to post a video of Walter just going absolutely nuts, uh, digging, uh, going in the, the water, going absolutely mad because there's not many large lakes and beaches in Leeds. And so it was his first experience of all that. So yeah, I'll post that in uh, the show notes of this episode over at This Week in Sales. And with that, Victor, let's jump into some sales news. Get us started, mate. All right, CRM marketing company, Optimove secures $75 million. Article written by Dan Anderson over at Pulse2.com. The funding, now have you heard of Optimove? Because I'd never heard of this company. Yeah, uh, the funding will support continued investment in strategic hiring and M&A, uh, mergers and acquisition, expansion of the company's CRM, marketing platform, and rapid growth. Will is thinking, why, Victor? Why are we talking about this? <laughs> I'm getting to it. So here we go. Optimove's SaaS technology combines a customer data platform, a CDP, with a multi-channel marketing hub, an MMH, designed for uniquely empowering brands to deliver personalized marketing campaigns to connect and engage with existing customers. And unlike more traditional solutions that rely on common rule-based orchestration, Optimove places customer data at its core, layering AI-based campaign orchestration on top of it. All that to say that really, I, I wanted to highlight this one because there, you're, you're, you're beginning to see what we've been talking about, and this is another example of it. These different platforms are being, you know, basically collapsed. CRM, customer relationship, customer facing. The CDP, which is the customer data, that's data gathering resources, just the software packages that manages all the data. But then also this marketing management hub that lets you get to all these social channels. So man, I'm telling you, the amount of money being thrown into this space, Will, is incredible. I don't, I would love to know, I don't know if there's like a, an equivalent of like market cap or there's a number that investors use to track the amount of investment that's going on within CRM organizations. Uh, clearly, if this is uh, Opti Mover just scored 75 million in, they call it funding, right? So it's private funding as opposed to it being a public company like HubSpot, Salesforce, um, whose stock price is going up and down so you can publicly track uh, value in those organizations. I'd love to know if there's an investment term or an, uh, what analysts would use to track the amount of cash being pushed into this sales, uh, CRM, sales enablement, sales intelligence like push that seemingly is going on at the moment. Because another 75 million here, 100 million here, 5 million there. It must be billions of dollars that are being spent in this market year on year, increasing at a rapid rate at the moment, which is which is insane. It, it's crazy. I, and I didn't put this in our show notes, but there's a, there's a unicorn list now of companies that are just making over a billion dollars or that are valued over a billion dollars. And the amount of money being pumped into these companies is just incredible, Will. I guess I'm highlighting this because two things. One is, again, 
reinforcing the fact that this is a market that just keeps expanding, and I don't think we've seen uh, you know the, the the full growth of this pie yet. But also the way these data platforms are consolidating, and I guess again everybody's going after Salesforce's lunch or you know Microsoft's lunch, and so it's very fascinating. I mean, it's a big market moving forward, uh, and I'll tie this into the uh, the book I want to talk to you about later on is that you're starting to see that these systems are really becoming much more intelligent and they're getting better, they're getting smarter, so get scared. So anyway, I thought I'd bring that up because I just thought it was interesting, uh, another consolidation. But do you mind if I move on to something fun here, Will? Because <laughs> I, I, yeah. I thought this was fun. How three college friends built a $1 billion business selling used cars. They're valued at $1 billion. Now, Will, if, uh, the idea, uh, if I, let me go through the idea. I'm calling this the Netflix of cars. That was the, what I inserted into the notes here. Caro, a play on the words car and hero. I don't know, I'm Spanish. That would mean car to me in Spanish, caro. But that's just me. I don't know if that's a play on words. Is a Southeast Asian online auto marketplace designed to simplify car deals using AI technology. In a region with a vast, by the way, talking about the Asia Pac region here, in a region with vast and growing digital savvy middle class, I love that, price sensitive customers were increasingly opting for second hand models. I don't think it's just there. I think it's also happening here. Is it happening over there on, on that side of the pond? Can't buy a news car. Uh, the, the, yeah. you know, the chip shortage is just, the, it's like an eight, uh, someone I was speaking to the other day just bought a new BMW. It's an eight month lead time for, and he wants to have it, a customized specification, all this kind of stuff. Um, that It's a highly spec car, but it's an eight month lead time. That's amazing. That is amazing. So continuing on, expanding middle class combined with low car ownership rates in Southeast Asia were, were really the main factors that stimulated new car sales. Now, Caro capitalized on that demand, rolling out its first online offering to individuals and wholesale dealers across Indonesia, Thailand, Malaysia, so forth and so on. It also added end-to-end -end financing. I thought this was interesting to reduce like customer friction, right? You got the loans, you got the insurance, you got the aftercare. But here's the part that got me going, aha. And I, I swear to you, I had this idea, Will. You ever <laughs> had this like, that, that was my idea. I had that idea. He said, so what happened in 2019, inspired by streaming giants, Netflix and Spotify, the company launched Singapore's first car subscription service, allowing users to lease a vehicle for a monthly fee with tax warranty and maintenance all included. That's really what common over here. Yeah. I'm assuming that's not common in the US from your response there. It is not. It is not. I've never, and I, I'm, I'm amazed at this company. I, I forgot what the funding level was, but they're valued at $1 billion. So I know Porsche do this in the UK and Europe, and you pay a, I might be butchering this slightly, but I'm pretty sure you pay a flat fee and then you can just change cars. So if you want a big SUV, cause you've got kids, but then you're going away to the Lake District for a weekend where there's amazing driving roads, you can change next month's car to a Porsche 911 within your kind of price bracket and they'll just come pick it up and swap it over. Of course, interesting. they then, factoring maintenance and stuff into the cars. So they're using their own garages and service teams to do the maintenance. So there's, I guess, long-term benefits to them owning uh, to them owning the car and not letting you have it. But this is what Tesla wants to do. Tesla have been super uh, public about this. Uh, are, you, are you familiar with Tesla, Tesla and the kind of uh, aspirations to be a fleet service? No, not at all. So what Tesla want to do I, we all go too far into this, but I find it fascinating. You could you could tell me if this is interesting or not, Victor. Sure. And we, we'll cut it short or carry on for the audience. What Tesla want to do is you never own your car. You just wake up in the morning and Tesla know when you go to work so that a Tesla Model S or whatever you are subscribed to arrives. It's all clean. It's all it, it's to your specification because every Tesla moving forward will have heated seats in them. They will have the uh, whatever it is, the all the options that you typically spec out in a brand new car and they're just either enabled or disabled to spend in on your subscription. So if you pay a little bit more each month, the, the heat seeks are in the car that shows up, but you don't get access to them. Um, whatever it is, full self-driving, whatever it is. When you are at work, that car is a an asset, right? That's just sat there depreciating. And so it will go off and do other jobs or take people places or do whatever it is. And then it'll come back when you need to get picked up from work. If that car isn't available, you know, because you need to go home early, another one will show up. So you'll never own the car, you'll just have a subscription to a a vehicle that will move you around. That's it, I, I didn't know this one, that, that's interesting. I, you, but you triggered me, is that like, you know, when you you could rent those scooters, you know, they, yep. they leave them everywhere, you can just rent the scooter. So in this case, you can just pick up anybody, any Tesla you want. Sure, but you can't just have a ton of Teslas littering the roads, and so they will come to you. That's why they're so focused on this autonomous driving technology 
because eventually there just won't be a steering wheel. You just you'll just get in essentially a taxi, and it'll become Uber, but even more efficient and uh, you know more more uh, more efficient from Tesla's perspective. Or they will own like what what like what Amazon do, where they own distribution, they own the marketing, they own the platform. Tesla aspire to do that. You just pay one flat subscription each month. Uh, tiered, depending on whether you want a big car, small car, fast car, whatever it is, heated seats, tinted windows, uh, I don't know what the other optional extras would be, and uh, it, it just shows up like an Uber would. That's interesting. That is, I, I look forward to that. I saw something, I should have put, I, I kind of deleted it from our show notes, but it was that Amazon invested like $150 million just to kind of sample some autonomous vehicles for delivery and to see how that works. So mm -hmm. I don't know how that's going to roll out, but I think that's interesting. Uh, last, by the way, last point on this article, it says what we saw was a change in behavior of car ownership. I think that's kind of interesting. Every time we're changing behavior, how we do things, really the gap in the market was to look for people that want the flexibility and more importantly, they actually want to try out new cars. That's yep. the obvious. But I think, uh, I think we're getting to, I don't want to use the word disposable society, but it's kind of moving that way, right? Like we just want to use it for a while and get rid of it. Depends how you look at it. I might want to get a new car. I don't. I have my cars for like five, six years. But I might want to get a new car every 12 months. But if it's part of a subscription, I'd pay a higher tier. And someone who's less, more price sensitive and less bothered about flashy new cars then gets that two-year-old car and then they have it for a year or so. So you can price it out and tier it out still as a subscription model. And just the, the, how new it is it kind, of, kind of goes into that. And, and, and there's a derivative here, right? In other words, it's environmentally more conscious. By default, right? But I potentially, be a, it depends yeah. what happens to those cars because the used car market, I think, it, so I, I have never and probably will never buy a brand new car because clearly as soon as you drive it off the forecourt, you've just lost 20% of the value. And I don't really give a shit about this idea of um, that you're, I don't know, the perception of buying a new car makes means that you've made it or anything like that. I always buy, like my new Audi that I just got is eight months old and it was 15 grand cheaper than if I'd brought it brand new. And the only mark on the whole of the car was a tiny scratch, which is actually really annoying. There's like gloss uh, black trim inside it. There's a tiny little scratch. That's the only thing I could see that it means it's done kind of the 8,000 miles that it, it had done. Um, I don't know where I was going with that thread then, Victor. Yeah, kind of no, no, no. talk about new disposable buy oh, use. Uh, so, yeah. so having a market for secondhand cars means that the car that Tesla sells wants, right, gets sold multiple times and the batteries are still being used as opposed to at some point going to a landfill if the whole marketplace, which Tesla and car automaker, automobile makers want, which is a new car every two or three years because that's how they're going to make their cash. So I guess it swings and roundabouts whether you can make that Tesla last. Can they refurbish it? Can they keep it in the fleet? Can they keep it in the fleet for 10 years at a lower price point? Or is it just going to get stripped for parts and dumped in a landfill? Don't know. Yeah, you know, I, I did this, and not to get off on a tangent, but I think it's important real quick. I was kind of, I've been concerned about batteries and disposal, right? So about a few weeks ago, I looked up, I said, what are they doing about these batteries? And believe it or not, there are a lot of companies that are able to uh, decomponentize <laughs> the actual batteries and really get, I think, 80 to 90% reuse out of them, mm -hmm. which made me feel good about the whole using of batteries. So I just thought I'd mention that. Uh, but it depends what... Is it the 80 or 90% of dangerous chemicals and uh, kind of mercury and, and all the, the, the dodgy stuff that you've got to dig out of a mine that comes from probably less scrupulously uh, appropriate places in the world? Or yeah. is it I'm, just aluminum? Yeah, I don't know. No, we don't know. But I, I think your point is well taken that developing the actual batteries causes a lot of environmental externalities and then getting, you know, getting rid of it also. So anyway, let's get back on track. Let's talk sales. Go, Will. Let's jump into some sales training news. Okay, so this is an article from TD.org, incredible domain name, sales training. Boot the, quote, sales camp for spaced learning. There's a few questions I want to pose you at the end of this, but I'll run through uh, some quotes from this article. Sales training and return on investment have a complicated relationship where, where sales leaders generally agree that training is valuable and necessary, but it doesn't always translate to desired results. The reason why, and we all know this, is because traditionally sales training doesn't stick if it's not reinforced. Now, Sparix IQ, how also have a terrible business name, but Sparix IQ Modern Sales Foundations Program provides 25 to 30 hours of learning, and they recommend that it's consumed one hour per week. 
And they're basing a lot of their marketing materials against the fact that that 25 to 30 hours would typically be done in most corporate training sessions of, we bring the whole sales team in, there's two, three, four days, perhaps someone like yourself comes in, Victor, gets everyone uh, riled up. Um, then we have perhaps the internal team come in and do the kind of product-based training, and then everyone goes off. And what Sparrow's IQ are claiming is that then retention of that information just goes poof, and just gets dropped off. And it was a whole, um, other than being motivated by Victor Antonio, which I'm sure leaves lasting impression in the mind of the the audience. It, it, the rest of it is just a waste of time, right? You, you go back to doing exactly what you were doing before. So my question to you, Victor, and then I'm going to ask you about the virtual flipped classroom concepts in a second. But is that a more appropriate and more intelligent way to train salespeople to do it an hour a week, half an hour a day, as opposed to a two, three, four day kickoff event, which is my experience of sales training. We all get dragged to a place. We all go out, get pissed in the evening, and we're not paying attention to anything anyway. Yeah. I, okay. So I'll answer it this way. I, I'm in total agreement that if you're trying to do 20 to 30 hours, you know, let's say in a week or even two weeks, you know, most of that information is going to be gone. I think the Ebbing House retention curve says you'll lose, you know, what is it, 75% within 24 hours, 90% within, you know, 30 days. So I agree with that. I also believe that, you know, when it comes to training, piecemeal is better. Uh, when you can apply exercises in this case, that helps. You've talked because you uh, on, on your on your website, Selling Made Simple, where you talk about using like flashcards and things mm -hmm. to kind of reinforce the memory. But there's also this thing where we, we, we talk about consolidation. That's it's a phrase they use in memory learning, right? Which is you need time to consolidate information, which is take your existing belief system paradigm and then match it up with the new information you're getting and combine it, consolidate it in such a way that you could use it. And so I love these strategy and approach of peace milling the training out. I don't know if one hour is enough. You know, I would say that uh, depending on what that one hour is, right? Well, yep. if it's a 30 minute uh, exercise with 30 minute, I mean, 30 minute lesson with a 30 minute exercise, then I can buy into it. But I, with the general principle, I agree. Overall, smaller chunk size is a much better training. What's your thought on that? I think, go back to the example of yourself. I don't want to kiss your ass too much. I feel like you can go on stage and change uh, perception, a paradigm, paradigm. You can, you could go on stage and flip a switch in an hour, but I think you're spot on of if I'm learning the sales process, and I'm doing it one hour a week, well, I've probably forgotten what I did last week by the time I do the the next hour. So that is probably more suited to more intensive learning. Oh, it's got to be cleverly split up. And then the whole retention side of things of you've got to use it, right? What's the point in yeah. learning something? And then it's not going to be consolidated unless you can put it to practice like, you know, the same day, yeah. a few days later. So I'm kind if of... I, can I add something? Well, because one of the things I do with my clients, and I think this is important. And I think, you know, other speakers should implement this strategy because it's, it's always a win for me is they'll say, Victor, we want you to come in for a keynote, right? 45 minutes, just talk about sales, wire them up, you know, get them all excited about the following year, following quarter, whatever it may be. But then I always ask them, can I do a two hour workshop afterwards for free? I don't even charge for it. And they're like, why? He says, well, the keynote will set up two or three key principles mm -hmm. that you've already told me they need to focus in on. Then we go to the workshop and we work on just those two or three key principles and that's it. And I found that the response, not only from, Obviously, the people who are hiring me are, is good, but the actual salespeople love that because it's it's more consumable, it's simpler, and you can have more fun with the exercises. For sure. And even just you saying that to me, Victor, I'm going, I've got to listen to this dude because I've got to put it into practice an hour later. I'm like a right idiot if I can't uh, kind of, uh, repeat what was said. And, and it immediately, it's like when you're in a classroom and the teacher goes, I asked one question at the beginning of the class and everyone sat there nervous then thinking who's going to get picked on next for the rest of it. Right. You don't ask any questions <laughs> and you're just, just lecturing from, from the, the front of the classroom. No one's going to pay attention. So yeah, that makes to it makes, makes total sense from uh, kind of all angles. Now, talking about classrooms and the structure of training, Sparks IQ say they employ a virtual version of the flipped classroom concept. I wasn't familiar with this. So for the neither audience, am I. neither, neither am I. So for Victor and, and the audience as well, this is where salespeople watch content, watch a video on the core topic before then jumping into teams, which is what I guess we're describing with the way you do keynotes here. Then they jump into teams or cohorts to do follow-up reinforcement training. That's literally what you just described, wasn't it? Yep. Sorry. I didn't read that. I should have read that. Um, I could have saved a lot. Couple of minutes there. <laughs> no, not at all. So I, it was just interesting the way that they've done that because a lot of 
um, sales trainers at the moment. I don't know if you want to mention any names. I know you're kind of familiar with a few people doing virtual sales training. It seems like they are doing more of a traditional lecture where there is in real time, you can ask questions, engage, but here's a series of slides. Here's what we're going to go through. And I've never heard of this flipped classroom concept before, even though you're obviously implementing it where you get people to consume something, focus fully on it, and then you practice it after the fact. I thought that was interesting. I, yeah, I, I, I got to highlight this because I, 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 Jeb Blunt, who you obviously know, I, I've been to his studios, you know, over at Sales Gravy, and he does it the right way. You know, we walked through some of the scenarios and he showed me, I think he's got like nine studios in his place now. Uh, it's just incredible. But he does a lot of this uh, within, he uses a vibe board like this mm -hmm. and he breaks people within the vibe board into groups. And then he brings them back virtually, sends them off again virtually, brings them back virtually. And he's the one that I've seen, to me, is a good role model of somebody to follow that knows how to really do training, especially group training, mm -hmm. virtually online and does it effectively and really knows what he's doing. For sure. My um, uh, regular listeners will know my my missus is a doctor here in the NHS. She, she, even though she's been a doctor for like nine years, she's still considered a junior doctor. She'll be a consu consultant in the not too distant future. So she's doing loads of training now on uh, you know, what you have to do as a consultant, the actual responsibility, how to deal with things, um, different uh, kind of threads that she hasn't dealt with in the past. And she's doing it all from home because um, the lecture theaters and stuff are closed still with COVID, uh, you know, however you want to you know, <laughs> debate the politics and the efficacy of that. So they're all doing these trainings from home, whereas they'd be in a classroom environment prior. And her, because I'm in the office next to her, typically we're working during the day. Those training sessions are very similar to how you just outlined of, hey, here's the key concepts. Here's 50 minutes of training grab a break. Now we're going to come back. We're going to split into smaller groups. You're going to discuss what we've just been through, ask any questions to the, I guess, team leaders within those smaller groups, and then we'll reconvene and then go back through more content. So clearly, uh, Jeb Blunt, has, there's, there's probably a, a methodology that's been used in universities in teaching and remote learning that most sales trainers are too reluctant to jump onto the back of that Jeb, being a smart guy, has gone, hey, <laughs> there's a ton of evidence and, and data here that this works. Let's go down this path. Yeah, I, I think what makes Jeb's uh, training stand out is that he really leverages the technology. Mm -hmm. Like, I've seen him use the vibe board, and he goes in there, and he's drawing, and da-da-da, talking to the group. Then he goes into another group. It's got a totally new board, and he's drawing and really doing stuff and walking through that. He really, he's learned how to use, I mean, he's got like three cameras in one room. So then he can use the different camera angles and really make it dynamic and engaging. So it's not just, let's share a room, let's go, you know, do a little breakout session. He really knows how to do it. It's, it's impressive. Amazing stuff. And we'll link to Jeb's website, Sales Gravy, in the show notes to this episode over at uh, thisweekinsales.com. I've actually looked selfishly just to see how he's doing things. And there's not that much. He just seems to have much free, because he's obviously killing it with the deals he's got with uh, corporate clients and that. He doesn't really have that much free content to try and decipher how all this works. But I'll see if there's any YouTube videos or anything I can link to. I, did, um, I, did, I gotta be honest, until I went to the studio, sure. I did not appreciate mm -hmm. like what he does with his corporate clients. And then I sat in on one of his sessions. He was training at corporate clients in different groups. I was like, holy, yeah. this is really good. It's well, really good. We're on the same wavelength here. Jeff, yeah. contact one of us. You need to do some content marketing, mate. Uh, double Absolutely. double your kind of use and all that by just a few, free, a few free sessions a month. Okay, let's move on because I'm conscious of time here. This is this is basically an ear just for you, Victor. <laughs> seismic. Hey, I love Seismic. I'm a Seismic fan. Seismic unveils, I'm going to do, for everyone who's listening to this, air commas, inclusive new training enablement program. No, This is no, from... No, tell me you're not going down this road. I didn't read the notes. Tell me you're not going down this road. This is from demandgenreports.com. So, Don't quoting from the well. article. Don't en do it well. Enable ship a program designed to foster an inclusive community that provides sales enablement training and opportunities for underrepresented groups. Oh, that, that's what the, the program is. And then quoting from Donna DeBerry, who's a seismic vice president of global inclusion, quote, the enablement space is booming and yet it's dis disproportionately white compared to the US population. So my seismic. question to you, Victor. I like, I like seismic. I really did. I really did. Go ahead. Um, with, without putting words in your mouth, I'm clearly teeing you up for some kind of conversation here. 
my question to you is, do we need in the sales space, in sales training, in sales enablement, in training in general, do we need, quote, inclusive specific training? Or is just good training agnostic to to inclusivity? Uh, Donna DeBerry, appreciate your position. Seismic, you're wasting your money. Do you know what I mean? You're wasting your money. I mean, I see stuff like this. It just, it just, it just irks me. And I realize you threw that because of my Hispanic background, you know, my my quote unquote minority status, which is, you know, I don't even use that because it just sounds too weird. In the world of selling, the only color that matters is green, mm-hmm. and the only gender that matters is neutral. Anybody can sell, right? I've I've seen the best of the best in women, the best of the best in men, and probably everything in between. To have, I mean, I mean, I'm just blown away by that. I think, like I said, I should have read this. First of all, enable ship, dumb phrase already. I'm already pissed off by the name. I think that's what the program uh, is called. Yeah. That's the. I know. That's yeah, the, the program is called. Yeah, an inclusive community. Tell me where, 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 where are people denied sales training? When you got all this free content on the internet, where are people denied training? And then to throw in this line, to throw in this what I call a, a very divisive line. The enablement space is booming, and yet it is disproportionately white compared to the U.S. population. I mean, where does that come from? Where, where does that stupid phrase come from? It's disproportionately white. Well, I don't know. Maybe because you have more whites in the United States. Maybe that's why it's disproportionately white. There's nobody denying anybody anything. So I see this, and it's just pandering, virtual signaling. Shame on you, seismic. I think it's, you know... You just wanted to check the box. I'm sorry. If you if, seismic, if I'm wrong and I'm not seeing something that you're seeing in the data, let us know. We'll put it on this week in sales. Other than that, your virtual signaling, you're checking the box. This is a waste of money and it does not do anything but draw lines. And I'm against that. That is, I've never had anyone put it like that. Of this can be framed up from the opposite angle of creating buckets of people that don't need to exist I, as in from my perspective of i i know that i yeah. i'm not bothered about any of this stuff like you know the best person should I'm get t- the job by the way you know, I, I all this totally, stuff. i'm totally bothered by this stuff because you know uh having come from a a chicago's internet city it was, it's, it's racially polarized back in sure. the 60s very racially polarized and so i realized that in order to be successful for anybody anywhere is that you have to transcend lines. You have to transcend race. I hate people who keep drawing lines. Mm-hmm. It's it's we're, we're so we're so hypocritical. Well, not to get off on my get on my little soapbox here, but it's all we all we all want to kumbaya, but then we keep drawing lines. I say transcend the lines, right? Human being, human being, good. That's a good enough category. Let's move on. And so when I see stuff like this, it's just pandering, just total pandering. You know, for a company that's really launching themselves into this, I think I don't know. Maybe they want to get some brownie points. I I. I I don't know how they were denied. How is anybody denied sales training? You know, <laughs> let me let me challenge you on this, Victor. Or please, let me challenge please. you to uh, to put I'm yourself. To let me let me challenge you to put yourself in Donna's uh, position. Clearly, mm. you know, a VP of a role sure. of a, a fast-growing company. She's no she's no idiot, right? There's definitely something to this. Whether the market is seemingly demanding it, and so they're providing it, which hopefully is is the case. You know, rightly or wrongly, we can talk about the 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 high level ethics of it and, and uh, morals or the the how things are politicized which is fine but why do you think this could be perhaps important if you this is a good faith I'm hoping for a good faith answer sure sure from Donna's perspective why could this be important the thing is I I it's hard for me to answer that well because I've not seen any evidence of exclusion do you know what I mean. I mean, so everybody who wants to participate can. It's almost like it's an open playground. If you want to play, you can play. So to say, to 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 be to talk about global inclusion. First of all, what an arrogant statement! Global inclusion. Have we not learned anything here in the United States? Have we not learned, like, if we don't nation build elsewhere, just build here first. Get that shit straight. Sorry, because uh, you know, just the, so. I've not seen any place. Look, the, the thing is, I go the opposite. I've not seen a place of exclusion when it comes to the sales force. I've never seen. I mean, I just don't see it. Information is democratized. Anybody can do sales. And pl- I mean, when we talk about when she said it's disproportionately white, I can go to BET, which is black entertainment TV. Guess what? It's disproportionately black. 
Okay. Uh, there's, a, there's an organization here called the National Sales Network, which is a black sales organization. It's disproportionately black. Okay. To me, when I, when I see these things, I think those things draw lines. I'd rather just say it's a sales network or that's a TV network, an entertainment network. And so when I see this, it's just, I don't know. Well, I'm just irritated by this because it's just inclusion. Show me exclusion first. Show me evidence of exclusion, and then maybe we can talk about inclusion. How's that? Challenge to Don and Barry. The Barry, the gauntlet has been thrown down. Yep. Show me where they've been excluded, and then we'll talk about it. Other than that, uh, pandering at its worst, mm. I now, think. Well, other than the last sentence there, I think that was a very fair comment of uh, maybe Donna can say, hey, there is evidence. We have studied this. We're trying to do our bit for this space. We feel like we can have a cultural impact here. Um, and it is something that can very easily be studied. And so if there is evidence there, hopefully um, I'll reach out but to Donna is, and see Will, if we get something back. Just one more line. What yeah. is the job, though? What is the job, though? So I'm. So what I need to now do, let's look at the U.S. I need to go, okay, okay whites represent 55% of the population. Check that. Something like that. Okay, blacks represent... 13% of population, check that. And then uh, we got Hispanics at whatever, 15%. We got Asians at 7%, not 4%. Oh, oh, but what about people who identify as? Oh, damn, it gets a little complicated here. Now, how do we work out? Do you, you see, it's, it's, a, it's a mess. It's a mess. It, because when you, start, when you start doing things by quotas or numbers, because that's the only way you're going to know if you solve the inclusion problem, right? You got to go by by some type of metric. What metric is you going to use? In other words, my question to Donna DeBerry is: When do you know you've reached the quintessential point of inclusion? And if you can define that, then we can have a real discussion on what inclusion really means. But I don't think you'll get there. On that note, Will, <laughs> might I transition into the next? Uh, please do. Okay. Please do. I want to go somewhere. Okay. So here it is. You can't. If you're watching that video, you're going to see this. Will, listen to me, man. This book, Tech Powered Sales. Have you seen this thing? It's by. Hold on. I've got a copy myself. Okay. One second. Take that. No, get it out. So as well as getting that, this book was written by Justin Michael and Tony Hughes. And I just want to say, man, this book, in my opinion, is a mind-blowing book. Uh, after having written the Sales X Machina book, there it is. Well, has got it. Will, I got, have you read it yet? I, I've skimmed it. I've had both the chaps on the podcast to yeah. chat about it. By the way, I, uh, the writing here, I think, is, is probably some of the best writing, like literally, in sales I've seen. Like, it's, it's very intellectually written. Uh, they, they go deep in some cases here, maybe just a bit too deep. Mm -hmm. So I, w I wouldn't recommend, by the way, this is not for the, it's not for the average or casual sales book reader. No. This is like, you've got to go really slow through this book because there's so much stuff packed in there. And I think, you know, it's a three-part book. I think they've done an excellent job in capturing what's happening, especially in the SDR, BDR world, uh, the tech, you know, the tech stack world. I think that it, they captured it like just, I mean, some of the, the, the subtleties and nuances of what's happening in the sales world were captured just there. So I, anyway, I'm really hyping this book up. Because, but I, again, this is, usually I can read a book in three to five sittings. I think this one has, has taken me about 20 sittings to read. Because it's so good, you have to stop and go, all right, let me absorb that one. Yeah, you have to stop. Let me absorb that one. So kudos to Justin and Tony. Great job on the book. So highly recommend the book. Big thumbs up. If you're, By the way, if you're a CMO, a CTO, a chief sales operation person, or anything that has to do with BDRs, ISRs, whatever, SDRs, and every R you got, uh, this is a great book to read. Do you agree with not, uh, the, the over majority of the premises within the book? I do, actually. I do. I, by the way, I, I had some data points just to kind of like, because I, I want to highlight this for you. I thought this was interesting. You know some of this data already, but I just thought it was interesting to highlight. And then you could tell me where you disagree or maybe kind mm -hmm. of find some fault in what they have. The average rep, uh, the tenure uh, for average rep is 1.4 years. That's down from 2.2 mm -hmm. since 2014. So that's gone. 83% of ISRs, inside sales reps, failed to hit target. 40% of ISRs last less than six months. Well, I mean, that's a big number. Uh, and their premise is, you know, there's IQ, intelligence, EQ, emotional quotient, and now the TQ, which is the technology quotient, which is they're saying is the, the last part of the trifecta. Uh, the tech stack I thought was interesting, and we've talked about this. The average spend is about $1,000 per month per, you know, uh, inside sales rep. 
Uh, they expect that to be, based on some of the people they quoted, between 2,000 and 5,000. I wanted to ask you about that. Do you, I mean, that's a lot of money per rep spending on, te on tech stack. And I, I kind of want to, maybe we can open it with that. What do you think of that? What do you think of that number? So I've had uh, Justin and Tony on the Salesman podcast. That will, it might actually uh next week. So a few days after This Week in Sales, this episode goes out. So you can check out there. I was, book is well researched. I re I've had Tony on the show a bunch of times. Uh, the first time I'm speaking to Justin. I like them both personally, but I wasn't sold on some of the projections of how things are going. From the perspective, I'll give you a very practical example of what you just said then. I think I covered this on the show as well, of which is going to be more effective. And, and, and I'm, I'm talking about large deal, large account complex sales now. This is me selling 50 grand, 100 grand worth of medical equipment to a surgeon. Technology is not going to help me reach that surgeon. Technology is not going to help me better identify, as far as I can tell, as far as I can see with the technology we have right now, what's going on within that account. I've got to drive over there. I've got to speak to people. I've got to be on the phone. I've got to build relationships. And you know, unfortunately, because I would love technology to solve all of those issues, that's what's going to solve those issues. And I'm going to be more motivated and just drive more revenue if you say, hey, you can have this tech stack for three grand that I'm not convinced is going to have a massive impact on my ability to speak to surgeons, um, the, the procurement team, all these walled gardens uh, of individuals, of groups when, who make these larger buying decisions. I'm not convinced technology can help much more than it already is because if it could, then everyone has it and you're still sat at the same uh, kind of um, starting point anyway. The differentiator in this is going to be content marketing, is going to be your expertise as a salesperson to be able to go in, consult, advise, uh, and that side of things. And I'd be way more motivated if my sales manager said, hey, we can buy all this technology or we can just give you three grand a month bonus extra on top of what you're doing if you're working over two hours a week or whatever it is. So that was the argument I posed to uh, Justin and Tony and uh, went back and forth on a few things. Uh, but that, that's my kind of stance with some of this. Yeah, the and, and I, I get your mindset. I, and I get that. I think when we're talking about like key accounts and you don't have a large portfolio of key accounts, so I think it's all situational, right? Mm -hmm. If I have 10 to 15 key accounts, your approach is my approach. I'm taking your approach, right? Sure. Uh, if I'm trying to penetrate a new market and I don't know, my, my total addressable market with terms of like accounts could be over like 500, then this is where the technology kicks in. But they do highlight something. So, you know, that, that I thought was interesting. And I think they kind of tried to slice it thinly. And that is they really in the first section talk about the frustration that, that salespeople have who are dependent on this technology trying to kludge it together. Yep. Uh, he says the, the salesperson today is becoming almost like middleware to help, you mm -hmm. know, between Salesforce and this, to try to kludge it together. The reason I mentioned the company earlier on, I think it was OptiMove, is that they're moving to try to consolidate some of these platforms to so you don't have to be, the, the human being doesn't have to be the middleware. And what I think is beginning to happen, and by the way, if you say right now, Victor, would you agree with that this is happening? I, I would be with you. Well, no, it's not. It's not even close so far. But I think where they're going with it is that this software is becoming smarter. The amount of data it's able to aggregate and sift through and track you online is incredible. And so the future seems like in another 10 years, let's just kind of say 2030, I think you're going to start seeing some really interesting movements. And I think the number of people selling, uh, their role is going to change quite a bit. It's, it's going to be more about interpreting the data. But at the end of the day, well, you still have to go make the presentation. I was thinking about this, and I was mm -hmm. thinking about you. I said, you still have to go make the presentation. You can't have a robot do that for you. But I think the uh, what I love about the book is that if you're not familiar with what's happening in the, the tech space with sales, if you're not understanding that, this is a great book. I would say it's a primer, but it's more than a primer. It's a great book to give you an understanding of some of the movements, whether you agree with them or not. It's an interesting analysis of what's going on from people who are actually doing it and experiencing it. That's what I loved about the book. Yeah, it's super well researched. I, I enjoyed, uh, as I said, I've not been through it at a, at, a, at a fine level. I've skimmed it for the interview and obviously I had uh, first-hand experience chatting with the lads um, and I enjoyed it. Um, but I just, I just want people to be careful of the sales role is going to evolve. And if we look back 10 years ago, when I guess I was just getting into sales 10 years ago, multi-billion dollar medical advice company, we had no CRM, there was an ERP uh, software that was terrible. I was literally not allowed to hand over product brochures, catalogs to surgeons because they wanted us to obviously keep in control of all this. Me knowing full well 
that at some point someone had sent over PDFs and the surgeons were just sending them around themselves. So I'm not that old school in the context of sales, right? I remember you might have, because because you're, you're old school as shit, Victor. You might have mm -hmm. been through this. I remember speaking to one of the reps who was training me at my first sales job, and he was like, oh, CRM, yeah. I used to just have a big Rolodex in the car, a massive one. And I'd be like, right, who's this person? This person. And it'd just be index cards clipped in a, in a massive wheel Rolodex. And that's how he managed his whole selling system. I was like, poof, sure. like mind, mind was blown. It could yeah. be as, as, and he said he had to have in the backseat of his car because it was so big and, and, and uh, yeah, arduous. They were, they were big and round yeah. like that. I, I think I came at the tail end of the Rolodex. Uh, my first uh, CRM was ACT. Yep. A database manager. That's mm -hmm. right before you know Salesforce. So anyway, but I, but I think you're right that we can't exaggerate how fast this stuff's moving either because it, it sometimes it moves like slow as molasses. Yep. And but, but I, I, I think, think it's, it's, it's I think it's moving fast, Victor. But I think because we're we're on the wave, and especially me and you, mm -hmm. maybe we look into I this say, more. By the way, can I correct it? Sure. I say the adoption moves sure. as slow as molasses. There you go. Sorry. I think because we're on the car as it's moving. We see it less. We see it being less fast than if you were observer. If you jumped out of sales five years ago to do something else with your career, take a sabbatical, mm -hmm. and you jump back in now, you'd probably be like, "Whoa, what? It, what is all? That? What is conversational oh. intelligence?" Maybe yeah, we're in the way, thick of things, right? Good, that that is a great analogy, Will. That is a really good analogy. That was actually pretty good. Well, I that's, nearly that's quite clever, dude. That's quite clever, actually. I nearly. Are you familiar with the Doppler effect? Yes. So I was nearly, I nearly went down the analogy of uh, being on a train and then the siren on a train moving forward that affects the sound waves, which sends, uh, changes the tone, which is the Doppler effect. I was like, no, let's pull, pull some of that yeah. back out. Let's dumb it down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Immediately, I went to a torpedo system. What are you paying? Yeah. Okay. Anyway, let's let's not go down that rabbit hole. But anyway, uh, I, I like your analogy about if you're on the train, it's not moving as fast, but if you're standing on the side watching the train, it's moving really fast. Yep, uh, and this works with the speed of light. If you shine a torch whilst you're on a train moving at 500 <laughs> miles an hour, the speed of light out of that torch is still yeah. the speed of light. Even yeah. if you shine a torch as you stood next to the track, you'd think it'd be 500 miles an hour less, but it's the same speed. How mad is that? Audience, I feel our audience just leaving us right now. <laughs> <laughs> talking about the audience Victor, let's move to culture corner we've got a couple of tv shows to talk about in a second but first we'll tease the audience with this next maybe not next week so i've got a bit of work to do to get make this happen maybe the week after next you've agreed to this you've signed up for the for the pain that this may cause us and we'll experiment with it we're going to try doing this week in sales live audience live. engagement or live wow. audience questions, see if we can get some of the people that essentially were slandering each week yeah, to respond yeah. in real time as well, because this will be posted out on LinkedIn. And other places. Come on, seismic. Let's go, seismic. We'll see you in a couple of weeks live. Well, look, Vic, we could even do it where I just tag people in the comments uh, and companies in the comments. I, I wouldn't want to pick on a person, but we could tag companies in the comments as we're talking about it. And if they've got a hot social media team, they'll be uh, kind of jumping on and listening and viewing as well. See if we can drive some uh, good faith debate on some of these subjects as opposed to me and you just going back and forth and uh, me purposefully adding things to the show notes that you're going to disagree with and then uh, just consciously trying to debate you at all times regardless of whether I agree, agree with what you're saying or not. Um, yeah, I'm excited. Live could no, be the that. future of this By show. Way, can, can I just ask, because I'm feeling a little bad here and I don't want to get off the show feeling too bad. Okay. He said, I, I agree with, and going back to Seismic here, I'm not changing my position. I, I, I understand their intent, right? And uh, on this side, I understand the outcome that they desire, right? So I'm with that. I don't agree with the strategy that we should, you know, create this type of inclusion group or something. But so I do understand the intent. I know what they're trying to do. I know what they want to happen. It's just that, is this the way to really do it? I don't know. So I kept my mouth shut. I'm not sure on the intent. I think there's a lot of corporate just bullshit going on where people are uh, making it look like they care about these things, which may be, may be a good thing to look at on, on the wider picture of, um, you know, I don't know, quality is not the right word, but you know, you know what I mean. Uh, there's a lot of corporate bullshit that goes on in this space where maybe the intent isn't all that good. Maybe it's just uh, the facade of, of good intent. So yeah, that's could be, piece. could be. But anyway, so we're going live. So super excited about that. And let me tell you what else I'm irritated by. This is like a week and a half ago. 
a week and a half ago, and I even looked at the date. I wanted to make sure I had the date right. September 25th, I started seeing Christmas decorations for sale already. This is, Will, it's September, three months out. Why don't we just, you know what? You know, let's go all the way. Let's go full throttle on this. Why don't we just say Christmas year round? Let's just do it. Let's just do it. Let's just get there. Because, I mean, you keep pulling it back. It was a month before. Now it's two months. Now it's three months. Let's just kind of go to summer. Maybe start it in summer. What do you think, Will? So it annoys me, but I understand it because there's probably a crap ton of businesses that are on the last legs right now that are like, we need a big Christmas. If we don't have yeah. a big Christmas, we're going that's under. Great. And so that's probably what's driving some of this. So on a, uh, that's my, my empathy coming out there. I appreciate it. But yeah, it is well annoying because... It, well, totally I don't right. want to sound like the Grinch, but I don't really care all that much about mm -hmm. Christmas. I've got stuff to do. It's just, yeah. it's, it's good to, it's good to go meet. Bah, the, humbug. It's bah, good to go humbug. meet the barons. <laughs> we'll, we'll go out. We'll, we'll have Christmas uh, dinner. Today. What the big problem, Victor, is um, my partner's working Christmas Eve. She might even be working Christmas Day. I'm not sure. Um, she's been screwed with the the doctor rotor this year round. So I'm gonna have to take Walt the dog to my dad's for Christmas dinner. And he's, he's just going to go mad. It's going to be the first year that we're not going to be able to have presents. Like, typically, we'll have like mm. presents laid out on the floor. And, uh, you know, we'll mm. all throw each other's presents in like piles and we'll all put them together. Uh, he's going to be going ape shit, like just ripping apart everything. So I'm going to have to suss that out. That's funny. That's funny. And by the way, if you don't have anything to do, I want you to watch this series. I think it's on Prime. Uh, Amazon Prime, which is called Squid Games. And it, I, I think you said you kind of heard of it. Right? I saw the, I didn't watch the trailer, but I saw the kind of the, the graphics that promote it on Amazon Prime. My wife and I binged on that in two days. It, it is, it is really, by the way, if you want to stay, if you want to understand human nature in different situations, this is a great show to watch. It's Korean. Uh, they did a fantastic job. I've seen kind of, you know, movies like this in the past, but this was done so well. And, the you know the I say the the ending and everything as it rolls out it was really well done but it's all about I don't want to spoil it but it, there have to go, it's a survival game you know with games and the dilemmas and the decisions that have to be made at the different stages of the different games is really fascinating to watch the human interaction and behaviors change throughout the whole game series mm -hmm. so Squid Games check it out my recommendation and I'm surprised you mm -hmm. hadn't come across this Victor because uh, it's mm -hmm. been massively publicized is the foundation. It's available mm, on gotcha. Apple TV. I think it's called Apple TV Plus. It's Apple's TV subscription service. It's based on best-selling seminal books of Isaac Asimov. Have you read any of his books, like I Robot and You will love them. He invented, I can't remember what it's called, but it's uh, like these rules that AI has to follow. There's like seven rules of like don't kill humans. And then the next rule in priority is whatever it is, so that AI didn't take over the world and kill everyone. He was the one who created those rules in a fictional setting, and they're now used by AI developers today. Um, you'll, I'll send you some links. He, you will love his books. They're all fiction books, but they're all these like moral conundrums that can come via technology, via... Um, send, me, send me your favorite. Send me your, what's your favorite? What would you recommend for the audience? If they had to pick one uh, Isaac Asimov book, what would it be? iRobot is good. Um, that's what the Will Smith film was based upon, but the film doesn't really do the book justice. And they're all relatively short reads as well. But I've just finished reading, and this is what the TV show is. It's called The Foundation. So it's thousands of years into the future. They've kind of forgotten where they came from, what Earth was, that kind of thing. Civilization has populized the whole of the universe. And this civilization, and you get this in the first episode, so I'm not spoiling too much. Civilization is starting to collapse. This guy comes along. He has invented a mathematical... Um, process of predicting the future where you can look at because the universe because there's so many humans at such a quantity across such a large space you can look at probabilities and because there's so many numbers the probabilities are, are likely to be true which you couldn't do on one planet but you can do across a galaxy across a universe mm -hmm. uh it calls it cycle history he's predicting that the galaxy the imperium is going to crash is going to fail <laughs> and he has a solution it. for it that's the premise. That's the setup. I love it. Star that's Wars. A good setup. That's uh, a, by the way, you sold you sold me on that. Good. You sold me on that one. Uh, George Lucas uh, credits loads of the Star Wars ideas based on his books. Um, the film itself looks very Star Wars esque. It's very uh, the TV show. Sorry, looks very Star Wars esque. Very cinematic. Me mega budget. Mega production. Three episodes out now. Really enjoyed it. It's all about the politics, and it moves quite fast through time of like 
you know, one episode might be 20 years before or 100 years after. Um, so it's going to be hopefully complex as the books are and, uh, you know, engaging and, and interesting as well. Love it. Love it. You sold me. I'm, I'm in. I'm in. Dude, we'll, we'll just turn into the Foundation podcast after this because you'll, I'm sure you'll, 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 be, you'll be loving the science fiction side of things as well. Love it. Love it. Cool. Well done, well. Anything else to add, Victor? Or should we wrap that, up there? That's it. Uh, new content on the, the Sales Velocity Academy. Go check it out. Uh, what do you got on your platform that's new? I have, maybe I'll talk about this publicly. I was going to talk about it privately with you. I've hired a bunch of writers. So hey to all the new writers that are writing content over at Salesman.org. I've tasked a couple of the writers to help me out with producing some training content. So I've gone through and said, this is the headline. This is what I want to do. This is what I want to outline. Here's the kind of analogies that I want to include. Here's the data points. And I've said, hey, you as a professional writer, you make this interesting from a learning design perspective. And so I'm going to get the first bunch of that content back probably on, uh, we record this on a Thursday, on Monday, Tuesday morning, Monday afternoon, Tuesday morning. So Victor, if these writers pull it out the bag, which I'm confident that they will because they've done loads of work for me on the blog so far, our training material overnight, because you, you're an author, right? You can you can write, you're talented in that space. Uh, our training content is just going to get twice as good within like two months because I'm going to get them to go through same training, uh, just produced at a higher level, more polished um, and I'm really excited to see what they, they come up with. So that's what I've been doing behind the scenes and just to kind of, what's the the, the the fourth wall, the third curtain, to pull that back for the audience and any members of the Selling Made Simple Academy. You're going to see, hopefully, a big refresh uh, coming in the oh, not distant future. All right. You sold me again. I'm looking forward <laughs> to seeing that. Well, well done. Well done. Cool. Well, we'll wrap up there. Victor, Antonio, I appreciate you. Uh, everything that we talked about is available in the show notes of this episode over at thisweekinsales.com. That is Victor Antonio, the king of sales. My name is Will Barrett, founder over at Salesman.org. And we'll speak with you again next week on This Week in Sales.